So we have arrived at our last video in the intuitive eating series. Today we are going to be talking about principle 10, which is gentle nutrition. And there is a reason it comes last. So if you find yourself just coming to this series with this video, or if you've skipped ahead, I would recommend that you go back to um, our intuitive eating playlist, which is linked below. Start yourself at the top, work your way through the principles, and then come back here to get the most out of it. Gentle nutrition and having that as the last principle of intuitive eating refers to the reality that there's been a lot of scientific research done on the human body over the last few decades and there are some general nutrition principles to follow when it comes to how we relate to food in order to help the body function optimally. Um, there are just some things that the body seems to do better with. So gentle nutrition kind of tries to tackle that in a healthy and balanced way. The reason it's at the end of the uh, principles is because if we are constantly worrying about doing these nutrition principles perfectly or having to do them right all the time or scared of what might happen if we don't do them right, we're not going to give ourselves the space that we need to eat with unconditional permission or eat to practice recognizing our hunger and fullness cues. If we are constantly trying to pilot the plane of perfect eating, we are never going to be able to um, get over and improve the damaging thoughts and behaviors that we have that are ruining our relationship to food. In our work at Calm Clinic with folks on intuitive eating, it seems to take about 12 to 18 months for someone to genuinely work through the principles of intuitive eating in order to arrive at a place where they feel healthy and ready to take on the gentle nutrition principles. Of course, throughout doing the rest of the principles, we are always discussing kind of a foundation of good nutrition to help guide the process of, um, you know, uh, learning unconditional permission to eat and honoring hunger and challenging the food police and all of those principles. But intuitive eating genuinely requires a therapeutic space that a person can be to experiment and explore their relation to, to, relationship to food without fear of being judged. Through the process of intuitive eating, oftentimes we might feel like we're not eating right or we're eating unhealthfully or we're eating in a way that, you know, isn't the best for our bodies. And sometimes the principles take us to a place with food that does feel very physically uncomfortable, but it's necessary in overcoming a longer pattern, right? It's necessary towards improving a long-term relationship to food. And actually, when we look at intuitive eating in the research, we see that it does a lot Lot better compared to cycle dieting and trying to lose weight over and over again when it comes to maintaining weight um, so maintaining um, a stable weight throughout the life cycle and it also intuitive eating helps with managing um, you know lifestyle related health conditions like heart disease um, and diabetes so you know, the intuitive eating process, although it sometimes feels unhealthy and it seems counterintuitive that we leave all the nutrition to last, it's just required in helping you get to that better relationship so you can navigate um, a good relationship to food for the rest of your life. The couple years of trade-off really seems like, you know, not much in comparison to that. So if you've been working at intuitive eating for a while and you really find yourself starting to think about what would it look like to start implementing these gentle nutrition principles again? Is it going to cause this slippery slope back into dieting or restrictive eating or eating disordered patterns? Or am I ready for it? I mean, I think this video is a good place to start. So I'm just gonna go over the basic tenets of what gentle nutrition looks like. There's certainly more detail in the book if you're interested, um, but let's just talk about what the gentle uh, nutrition principles are, you know, kind of on their face so you can get a taste of where it might go. So the first tenet of gentle nutrition, of course, as we have harped on over the uh, entire series, it is quantity, right? So um, there is a real critical uh, component of intuitive eating and gentle nutrition. That means that we need to eat adequately. We need to eat enough for our body. And ideally throughout this process, process we've honed our internal energy regulation system to be able to uh, dictate appetite and fullness exactly in relation to what we need to be satisfied in terms of food quantity. 
Um, if you're finding that appetite is suppressed, that means we might need to examine and modify some external factors that might be interrupting our relationship to those cues. Um, we might need to rely on structured eating until we can get to a place where our intuitive eating signals are able to kind of dictate the course for us much more clearly. And of course, in some cases, um, depending on somebody's, you know, um, uh, like a medical diagnosis or if they have an appetite suppressing medication that they require um, to stay on, sometimes a meal structure ends up being a part of the gentle nutrition process. So some of gentle nutrition might be reckoning with that as well. Next, we come to the macronutrients and uh, principles, um, uh, gentle nutrition principles related to that. So your macronutrients are your calorie containing foods, right? Carbs, fat, and protein. And um, to start with your macronutrient needs, we have to understand that the body needs 50% or more of its nutritional intake to be coming from carbohydrate. And we are gonna find carbohydrates in whole and refined grains. Uh, we're gonna find it in fruits and vegetables. We're gonna find it in plant-based proteins, nuts and seeds, and dairy. So the body and the brain specifically require 20 to 40 percent of that carbohydrate intake just to keep the brain and central nervous system functioning optimally so that's one of the ways to think about why our carbohydrate needs are so high um, our brain has been uh, has evolved to run most efficiently off of glucose molecules which is what carbs break down to um, it can run on ketones but it's kind of that emergency backup system um, and as I always say to my clients, why do we want to run on our body's most inefficient way of getting energy to the brain when carbs are always readily available? There's a great mix of um, nutrient-dense carbs that we can incorporate, and we should be doing that to make sure that our body is functioning um, with what it needs. In addition, your brain can't store carbohydrates. So once your uh, carb supply is gone, your brain is just on this timer of kind of clicking down until the next time it can get that carbohydrate replenishment. So, you know, on a plate, this looks like at least half the plate, sometimes two thirds of the plate should be coming from carbohydrates to make sure you get that nutritional need addressed. Once your carbohydrate needs are addressed, uh, the next place we go to is proteins and fats. And um, for me as a clinician, uh, this becomes uh, based on the person's preference and comfort level. So um, ideally, you know, if uh, half uh, or a little bit more of the meal should be coming from carbs, that second half um, is gonna be divided, right? Between the, the fat component and the protein component. Um, each body has its own, you know, genetic propensity for how it has developed to digest proteins and fats, right? So for proteins, we need to have these um, acids in our stomach to help break that down chemically um, early in the digestion process. For fats, we require bile um, from our gallbladder that are required to emulsify fats for easier digestion. Um, we also have different enzymes developed specifically for digestion proteins or digesting fats of course we have them for carbs too but you know depending on that person's uh, genetic makeup and how they digest these foods that's what's going to decide for them how much of each of these components should be part of the meal um, as a dietitian I recommend that both be present at the meal I think there should be both present um, and the body certainly needs both to be present for the most the most part um, and then you know if someone is having too much protein in their diet they're gonna feel probably uncomfortable Comfortably stuffed, overly full, just walking away from the meal feeling, you know, like they've had too much. Whereas if a person has had too much fat in their diet, they may feel uncomfortably full, but they're often very likely to have some digestive upset, right? Some um, disrupted bowel movements in some way, whether it is um, loose or constipated. Um, so using a combination of those factors, that's generally how I help clients determine what should be there in terms of protein and what should be there in terms of fats. After we've got macronutrient distribution uh, settled uh, based on the person's preferences and needs, the next place we come to is your micronutrients. And so micronutrients are your vitamins, your minerals, your antioxidants. And these, um, so to help uh, explain these in my session, sometimes I use a car analogy, forgive me about, uh, if you don't know a lot about carbs, cars, but I will do my best. Um, 
So with micronutrients, what we want to think about is having a car and getting all the details taken care of, right? Like you get new tires, you get an oil change, you replace the wipers, you get the transmission serviced, you get all of these functional components up and running for the car. That is what micronutrients are doing in your body. There are... Uh, chemical equations firing in your body every second uh, and probably to the tune of thousands or millions it's probably impossible to quantify and for every single chemical reaction that happens in your body a vitamin or a mineral needs to be there to facilitate that interaction and when the micronutrients are not there we can feel it either in our energy or motivation you know the body literally not making enough ATP to keep the cells running we might feel it in terms of you know lacking with serotonin or dopamine or oxytocin or other brain chemicals that help us maintain mood regulation we might see it in hair skin and nail quality there are many places that the body will start to um, have downstream effects if we don't have enough micronutrients present in our diet so you know, micronutrients are most often going to be coming from fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and other plant-based items. Generally, this looks like incorporating one of those foods at each meal and ideally at snacks as well. Um, a rough portion size estimate is about hand-sized. We don't have to get, you know, overly measuring about this. Um, but if you are trying to incorporate some version of fruit, vegetable, nut, seed, etc., something plant-based at each meal, you are very likely to be helping your body with getting adequate micronutrient needs to keep all of those systems functioning optimally. The other piece I want to say about micronutrients in fruits and vegetables for the most part is that there is a huge emphasis on in diet culture on you know getting enormous amounts of fruits and vegetables and often supplanting calorie containing or macronutrient containing foods right your carbs proteins and fats um, and the problem with that is when you have a diet that's really really high in fruits vegetables or micronutrients you can eat all of that in the world kind of to go back to the car analogy you can fix up the car however you want if at the end of the day you don't put enough gas in the car you're not going to get very far and the macronutrients in our diet our carbs fat and protein are the gas in the car that keeps us going right I always say it's the it's the logs on the fire that keeps our body going throughout the day so in order to achieve a balanced diet and a harmonious relationship with food we need to figure out our balance of macro and micronutrient containing foods together so it's not that one is better than the other it's that we need to focus on the balance and what's right for you. Next is hydration. Water is a nutrient and oftentimes that falls by the wayside. When we get really busy, our thirst signals might be suppressed as well. So that's another place that we really want to open up awareness around. Um, water is literally uh, the, uh, the, the internal makeup of what our inside body lives in. It is the inside of every single of the 37 trillion cells in our body. Um, it is the majority of our blood volume and what keeps our heart pumping. It is required for digestion and it's how we absorb all the nutrients from food. We also have 39 trillion microbes living symbiotically somewhere on our body and they all require water to maintain. So water is incredibly important to feeling our best and operating at you know full capacity. So, you know, what I find in practice is that generally that eight cup a day recommendation that's kind of like age old fits for many of my clients. Um, generally, I find that my clients need somewhere between 64 and 80 ounces a day um, and then plus or minus depending on, you know, other uh, factors. So I would say, you know, working on starting to become more aware, aware of your hydration is definitely part of, you know, gentle nutrition in that practice. The last piece I'm going to cover with regard to gentle nutrition is processed foods. And so I want to make a disclaimer. Um, when I say processed foods, I want to separate out foods that are, I guess, technically processed, but have been cultivated by the human species over centuries, right? Um, to be a part of a healthy, balanced diet. Um, processed foods that I think of as just normal healthy foods um, are usually breads, pastas, yogurts, things that are um, cultured over time, 
hummus, um, foods that, you know, uh, human beings throughout centuries and across um, cultures, um, those processed foods are super nutrient containing, super nutrient dense, and a critical part to maintaining, um, you know, a healthy uh, nutritional intake to keep our body going. When I'm talking about processed foods as a part of gentle nutrition, what I'm talking about is uh, fun foods, food-like items, right? Um, candy, chips, donuts, uh, jalapeno poppers, onion rings, french fries. Um, these are the processed foods that I'm talking about. They're not necessarily um, you know, nutrient containing and they are more geared towards fun um, and enjoyment and celebration. So those foods typically are higher in fats, they're higher in salts, um, they're higher in sugars, and they're just like meant to please the palate. So when it comes to gentle nutrition around these types of processed foods, what we have to recognize is that they do contain the macronutrients, right? So in essence, they are logs on the fire, um, but they typically don't contain a lot in the way of micronutrients, right? So um, again, this doesn't necessarily mean that they are healthy or unhealthy. It just means that we have to incorporate them into an overall balance in our relationship to food. Um, so the idea is that with processed foods like that, we can incorporate them uh, situationally, right? Multiple times throughout the week or maybe sometimes even every day, um, but they usually don't make good foundational elements of food. And so there might be parts of the intuitive eating process where processed foods are actually something that you're consuming a lot during a particular part of the intuitive eating process. And it may not feel particularly healthy or it may feel like it's uh, bringing up a lot of critical feelings in you um, but we have to work through you know having a little bit of freedom with those processed foods or I guess ultra processed foods um, before we can get to a place where ideally we can have some balance in them again and know that our body's probably going to feel our best when we are getting also some micronutrient dense foods um, in order to balance those out. So that is a very general overview on the general tenets of uh, gentle nutrition for the intuitive eating series. Um, if you have enjoyed this series as much as I have enjoyed making it, I hope that you will go back to the original material that gives you a lot more detail in walking through all these processes um, and principles. So there is an intuitive eating audiobook that gives you a lot more practices and it's meant to be supplemental to the original text as opposed to a direct reading of that text as far as I know from what I remember when I listened to it. Um, there is an intuitive eating book for teens, so for younger people who are navigating this, I think that's a great way to get them into thinking about intuitive eating. Um, in the original intuitive eating book, there is a specifically a chapter on parents, on how to raise intuitive eaters out of your kids, um, which is a great chapter to get into. Um, there's also a chapter on special considerations for eating disorders. There is an appendix of way more exercises for each of these principles. And of course, there's a reference section for every single scientific article they, they pulled in the making of this model. Um, so I hope again that you've really enjoyed this. And if you are looking to take your first dive into intuitive eating, um, buckle up and enjoy the journey. It's been a pleasure.